yeah, I guess I am seeing more work made by people of color come my way. I understand like the lens is on us now, you know, and like, I guess I am leery of it being performative. So I am waiting on seeing how actionable it is. It'll be interesting to see what gets produced, what gets attended. Will boards change? Will funding streams change? Good morning. This is Epicenter NYC. We connect our communities to news, information, and to each other. I'm Amivora. Last April, Broadway theaters closed their doors. The shutdown forced many artists and performers in New York City and around the world to adapt to an entirely new way of connecting with audiences, all in the midst of a global pandemic. Today, Epicenter NYC publisher Mitra Kalita talks to actor April Mathis about how she coped with the changes brought on by COVID-19 and what she thinks the future of theater in New York City looks like. April is an Obie Award-winning actor with a long list of theater credits. She most recently starred in Tony Stone at the Roundabout Theater. April is also a member of Elevator Repair Service, a groundbreaking experimental theater company. Before we jump in, a quick message from our friends and sponsors at McKinsey & Company. Breathless to voice what gasoline is to a car. You know, if you have no gas in your car, your car goes nowhere. The same thing holds true for The Voice. That's Denise Woods, author and esteemed voice and dialect coach. She's featured in McKinsey & Company's newsletter, The Shortlist. The Shortlist is a weekly curated sampling of McKinsey's need-to-know stories about work, the economy, and culture. If you don't breathe, you have no voice. For more of our best ideas, quick and curated, check out The Shortlist at mckinsey.com forward slash shortlist. That's mckinsey.com forward slash shortlist. And thanks. Now back to the show. Here's Mitra and April on the reopening of theaters around the city. All right, April. I'm so grateful that you're taking the time. I know everything is like opening up again and busy, so I'm especially grateful. Yeah, sure. So what I'm trying to get a sense of is both how this past year has been, how it's going, and how you're envisioning life in September and and beyond, right? Especially as things fully open up. I wonder if we could almost just start at the beginning, if you could tell me when you knew this was going to be serious and when did you know this was going to affect your own livelihood? I was in rehearsal for a show that was supposed to happen at a Bard Summerscape later that summer of 2020. And I had had a bunch of stuff lined up for the year. Like I had plans for Broadway. I had shot a pilot and we had gotten to a point in rehearsal where we were like sanitizing, wiping down all surfaces and, uh, Like, I think somebody in the room had a cold and they were like, it's not coronavirus, you know, but nobody was thinking of wearing a mask then. And uh, once Broadway shut down, we had a conversation with the company about whether we should continue rehearsals for the rest of the weekend or if we should just stop right there. It was just a weird time of not knowing. It was a great blank page opening up, but... Once our show shut down rehearsals, that was just kind of like, oh, maybe nothing will happen. Like in all the things that were like, okay, let's uh, plan for fall or, oh, let's plan for summer. I just had a sinking suspicion that like, there's no way that all of this could get fixed in time for that to be okay. Was this year... A unique year for you in terms of uh, a lot of work was it supposed to be or is this always how it's been for the in your career 2020 was going to be like the fulfillment of a lot of years leading up to what it was going to be like it was going to be a banner freaking year 
I had had like a personal loss right before then, but I was thinking, okay, that'll be what I'm carrying. I thought, but like, you know, thing happened, but there's all this good stuff that's to look forward to. And um, it was a really big surprise that none of that stuff happened. <laughs> and so how did you pivot? What, 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 was the, what was the first thing that you did? Um, I turned around and looked at who was in my house, <laughs> meaning my husband and child, and just tried to hold some gratitude for us and our health and um, checking on my folks and making sure they were okay. Cause I have sisters in California and Texas. Two of my sisters in Texas are educators. Um, my mom was a frontline worker in Texas. She's a nurse. And it was really just about like, it's not about your career right now. It's about, you know, family and um, staying healthy and like the state of the world. <laughs> what is the meaning of all of this? What is civilization? What does it mean to be living in this, in this time period? You know, I wrote something in my journal that was like, time is the great leveler. And so I just kind of went really elemental. But it's so profound because it's true. It's it sort of distills us into both the time we have as well as the times that we've been through, right? Did you do any um, Zoom performances? And tell me, tell me how that came to you and what that process was like. For me, it felt a little bit like staying in touch with my instrument because I was like, I don't know when I'll get to perform in front of folks again. I don't know when I'll get to be in my whole body as an actor again. So I need to maintain the relationship I have to my artist self mm. as much as I need to like keep up with my physical health. And it's funny because some of them were more demanding than others. Like, you know, there were certain ones that were super choreographed for Zoom. Like this is a skill that we need to learn. Like it was kind of overwhelming because it was like, you know, you know that the world's on fire, right? Why are we doing all of this stuff? And then some of them were more simple and were like, it's just a playwright who needs to hear this new play. It's not going to be recorded. It's not going to be available for public viewing. And, uh, you know, occasionally there were like some self tapes for TV and film, which actually felt really galvanizing because that was like, this is for a job that would be in the world and this is like what you are used to doing like it wasn't a compromise tell me about if you're comfortable your finances during this period was there was there a difference i mean was there a panic was it what what, what was that like well the thing is my husband and i are both freelance artists so i think what people don't understand about artists is we're not children we're not just like fun, like free spirits that just will do it for whatever because we love it. No, it's like we have a bottom line. And so I will tell you that the uh, pandemic unemployment insurance was very helpful. And so uh, we were able to pay our rent, which is more than I can say for quite a few people in my building. And we live in artist housing. So we were really grateful for that, that we didn't have to stand in a bread line. You know, I'm not a famous TV star, so I do live paycheck to paycheck. And while I've had gotten to like a pretty reputable place in theater, like the last big show I did was at the Roundabout Theater. That was just the beginning of that kind of work for me. So just like I asked you that, what was the turn when you knew COVID was a thing last year? Has there been a turn of normalcy for you or has it been more gradual than that? And do you anticipate Broadway's opening in terms of, you had mentioned that you might've been on Broadway. There were plans for something last year. Is that, is that in the works for this year? Tell me how you're feeling about that. I don't know what's up with the project that I was attached to. So 
I'm over here waiting with bated breath because it's one of these things that like still could happen, but we don't, we don't have any answers yet. As my read on the industry from the folks that I know is like, there are some things going forward right now, like, you know, Shakespeare in the Park is happening. I know a lot of people are doing that. Um, the big unknown is what will they standardize from Broadway house to Broadway house? We, that hasn't been communicated to us in the industry yet. I don't know if people from out of town will be required to show proof of vaccination. I don't know if they'll have temperature checks. Like we don't know and we don't know if it's gonna be standardized. And I think a, a lot of people, they don't wanna be exploited because yeah. there's a thing that doesn't get talked about a lot in uh, theater and that is how low the wages are. It's been something that we've been negotiating before COVID, but now like safety is so tantamount. As you're talking, I'm thinking there's just so much pressure on actors because if you ask any New Yorker, when will it feel like we're really back? Mm -hmm. They'll say, when I'm sitting in a theater mm -hmm. watching a show, meaning you all are a symbol of the city's vibrance and culture and reawakening now, I guess. So I I'm just wondering, do you feel like there's increased value of culture workers in New York City? We'll see, won't we? Because the proof is in the pudding. Like, if I'm still not able to pay my rent and my health needs aren't respected and I'm being asked a lot without giving a lot in return, then I think that'll, that'll be the answer. We all want Broadway and all the rest of the New York theater world to thrive and be successful. But I think a lot of like the louder voices of protest you're hearing are coming because yeah, the, the economic disparities have been really laid bare. Like some people had like a, a nicer COVID than other folks like, and I'm talking about people in the arts. It's hard, it's competitive. And yeah, I, I, I think a lot of us are waiting to see like, well, Hollywood put its money where its mouth is and that the people behind the camera look like us. I think we're starting to see it, but you know, I've also walked into rooms since this where I'm like, oh, all the activism that I thought was happening is happening online on my particular Instagram feed. It feels really loud to me, but like, it's not everywhere. Not like, everywhere. Well, well, then you walk into the room and you're like, this room looks just like it looked last year. So we, you talked about George Floyd. I meant to ask you about that in sort of the year that was. Mm -hmm. uh, has the work changed? Yeah, it's interesting because you're seeing a lot more interest in Black work, Asian work maybe, politically charged work. And I'm hearing different things from my white colleagues that are louder than they've been about anti-Blackness you know, there was just a report from the Asian American Performers Action Coalition called the Visibility Report that looks at, like, breaks it down by numbers to look at, like, who's visible, who's invisible. 58.6% of all roles on New York City stages went to white actors. 29% were Black, 6.3 were Asian American, 4.8 Latinx, uh, 1.3 MENA zero indigenous and 18% BIPOC who identify as mixed race. So like I'm seeing more of that kind of stuff and transparency. And yeah, I guess I am seeing more work made by people of color come my way. I understand like the lens is on us now, it, you know, and like there are land acknowledgements before Zoom plays and people go around and say their pronouns. And I guess I am leery of it being performative. So I am waiting on seeing how actionable it is. And I, 
I, you know, it'll be interesting to see like what gets produced, what gets attended, like will boards change? Will funding streams change? Do we get to hear from playwrights of color that aren't writing from an issue forward place? Right. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. It'll be interesting to see. So my last question for you is, um, I, it might be two questions, but you mentioned sort of the existential questions that arise. Mm -hmm. Why acting? Why acting? Yeah, man. Um, I think that, yes, it's important to do physical things in the world, like care for somebody's body if you're in the healthcare system. But I think the ways that we perceive what our existence is, I think we do that through art, through expression, through narrative. And I think there's a narrative that Derek Chauvin had in his head when he saw George Floyd. And there's a narrative that a lot of people in the world, in, in the white imagination, there's a narrative about what somebody who looks like me or George Floyd or my child is like. And I think what I do as an actor is give more fodder for your brain to construct a different narrative. Because these stories are ingrained. You can read your baby uh, James Baldwin in the womb and that baby will still come out and be affected by a piece of advertising that they see. Um, like we're so bombarded with narratives about black people, people of color, people of different ability, you know, people of different gender identity expression, all of it. And uh, it's old. All of this stuff is old and it's it's hard to get it out of us it's hard to get misogyny out of us you know and uh i feel like the work that artists do particularly like in the form of acting storytelling are doing that work to infect our imaginations to show us life and to show us all different dimensions of how we look at human life. April, thank you. That's amazing. I'm so grateful to you. You can find more on April, including her past and future performances, by using the link in our show notes. Next, we're sharing a story from one of our neighbors, someone just like you. Today, I'm excited to introduce Eric Garcia. Eric is a novelist, a screenwriter, and a TV showrunner who currently lives in Chelsea. He and his family attend every type of theater they can find. Broadway, sure, but also off-off-Broadway, immersive soundscape art installations found in Brooklyn basements. Here's a bit of his New York story. You know, we were very fortunate to be here in March of 2020 when everything was uh, starting to go downhill, of course. And, and because we're theater people, we see uh, a lot and constantly and my wife and son uh, the night before broadway shut down saw come from away uh, which is a beautiful show and uh, my oldest bailey and i we saw a show uh, by young jean lee called uh, we're gonna die which is absolutely amazing in retrospect kind of a creepy show to be seeing but happens to be a beautiful celebration of life anyway theater then of course shut down and for a year and change, there was nothing. And then we came back to New York, and we were very fortunate to be the first in the first uh, performance of um, Blindness at the Daryl Roth Theater, which was amazing. The show is great, uh, but really what was amazing was to be in a room with uh, 99 other people, it's about 100 people, I think, for the show, uh, experiencing a form of theater again. And, you know, when they said, uh, welcome back to the Daryl Roth Theater and the first show uh, back in New York City, people absolutely lost their minds. Uh, and I think we were primed. The show happened to be great, but whatever the show would have been, 
would have been absolutely amazing. So I think for theater fans, for music fans, for anybody who uh, really loves live performance, uh, it was so hard being away, I think we didn't realize it until it was back. I came to New York uh, just a few months ago for work, really. Um, I had originally come in 2020 also for work, producing a television show, and we're shooting it here. Um, and I had come with my family when COVID shut everything down, and we went back to California, which is where we live, live. But I was excited to be here in New York. So once we were able to get back here, we did. And, and that's really what prompted us to, to move here. And, and, you know, it was while I was moving here is when I ended up getting involved with, uh, with Epicenter. And I've always loved the city. I've always come really as a tourist. I grew up in South Florida, and my parents would bring me to the city quite often. Uh, you know, my parents were theater goers. They turned me into a theater goer. My family and my children are theater goers. And so, you know, I really got to know New York initially, um, you know, Manhattan and, and Midtown Manhattan and the theater district of Manhattan. I did not know a lot of other stuff. And um, when my oldest child, Bailey, came to New York to, to be a student, a college student in theater, is when I really started to learn a little bit more about the city um, and started to kind of go further afield. Uh, I've really started to learn about the different boroughs and find just the amazing different neighborhoods and, and, and worlds and lives and cultures that are out there um, and really just having a great time exploring all of that. I think my favorite New York City sound, this is sort of odd, but I like it early in the mornings uh, when there's really not a lot of people out on the streets. And there's just, you know, the, a street sweeper going by, you know, on the, on the street. Or even if it's just, you know, a single car. There's something about the quiet of the city, the, 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 the majesty of the size um, and of the energy of the city right before it kicks in. That's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be here again next week. Epicenter NYC is a part of the URL Media Network. This coverage of jobs and business in the pandemic economy is funded in part by a grant to URL Media from the Knight Lenfest Local Media Transformation Fund. Don't forget to check out our new membership offerings. They start at $4.99 a month. And you can always reach out to us directly at hello at epicenter-nyc.com. Our intro music is All the Pretty Horses by Karavika. You can find more of their music on their website, and it's also linked to in our podcast description. Adios!